Hey, I'm going to invite you to take a seat, uh, grab your Bibles or your Bible apps, and turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9 is our text. If you're in the room and you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1030, 1030. You'll be able to find Luke chapter 9, be able to follow along with us in the text as we're studying. And as always, if you're here and uh, you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one of those with you. Yeah, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, let us know. Message us. We will mail one to you, deliver one to you, get one to you one way or another because we want everyone to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, uh, I should just uh, take a minute and introduce myself because some of you are new and uh, you don't know who I am and why I'm up here. Uh, my name is Chad and I, I've been pastor at Calvary for 30 years and I just got back from a six-week sabbatical uh, celebrating 30 years. And uh, I haven't preached in six weeks. I hope you guys are ready for a long sermon. Uh, Anyway, hey, uh, on my sabbatical, it was a great time. Uh, a lot of you have asked, are you rested? No. Uh, I, I play like I work. Uh, so, uh, that, uh, so we drove over 4,000 miles uh, during this time off. I played 16 rounds of golf. Uh, I spoiled grandkids incredibly, and I prayed and read and listened, and I am glad to be home. Uh, and uh, so it is, uh, it is a joy for me to be here. I hope you're excited about being here. And uh, speaking of being home, I spent about, uh, you know, probably two-thirds of that time in cooler climes, because everywhere is cooler than Havasu. Uh, that's easy to get cooler than here. Uh, but uh, so I'm back to the heat. Is it hot enough for you guys? It, it is. Some of you are like, yes, we love the heat. But you know what helps with the heat, right? It's, it's having a pool or having friends with a pool, right? Because then you can go over, you can cool off and that kind of stuff. And, and I've been at a lot of pool gatherings through the years and I've noticed different types of pool people. You know who you are, so we're gonna do a little confessing here. So, all right, who are you, who, who's in the room? Yeah, you guys gotta answer at home too, so if you're watching this with somebody else, you guys gotta confess as well. Who, who here in this room or just online, who, who of you just sees the water and you don't do anything but just run and just jump in? Come on, go ahead. Some of, the, oh, uh, some of, those, some of you are that way, okay. How many of you go and you stick your toe in the water and then you just jump in? Because that's what I do. I always feel it first. I'm going to jump in anyway, but I want to like know, is this going to be a shock or not? Now, how many of you do the whole incremental entry? Like, you know, you step on the first lap, get your ankles, then you get your knees, and then, and then you kind of get to your waist, and you splash a little bit, and you get upset at your kids for splashing you. Because like, I want to get the, the you know, how many, okay, let's see, how many of the incrementals are, okay, that, that's the dominant part. How many of you actually, you know, just sit with your feet in the water or you camp out on the Baja shelf in the chair and, and that's all you do? All right, okay. All right, how many of you, this is going to be hard to confess, how many of you are just trying to look cute and you never actually get in the water? Not when people are there. All right, some of you, some of you admit that. You're just, uh, you're just showing off your Speedo or whatever. And uh, see, so here's the point. No matter how you get in the pool, there's no reason to have a pool or be at a pool unless you get in. So today, so today I'm going to ask you a question, and that is, are you all in? Are you all in? And, and I'm not really asking for me. I'm asking for Jesus. Here's what he says. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. Now it happened that as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and Jesus asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And Jesus strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. 
For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is crystal clear about what it means to follow him. And he doesn't offer an option where you just get your toes wet. I mean, there is no ankle deep only option for following Jesus. He wants us all in or don't really bother. I mean, Jesus wants us to get off the fence and commit. He, he doesn't want part-time followers or half-hearted worshipers or moderately invested disciples. So are you all in? Because Jesus wants all of you. I mean, he's really not calling us to be one hour a week worshipers. He wants to be your life force. He wants to be the reason you live. He wants to be the motivation for every thought you think, every value you have, every decision you make, and every action that you take. He wants all of you. So are you all in? And before you answer enthusiastically, yes, because that's the church response, and we all know it. I know what I'm supposed to say. I know what the correct answer is. Um, let me just share with you what Jesus expects from his followers. Now, if you're in the room or joining us online and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I really want you to listen in because we're not going to, you know, candy coat anything. We're not going to try to soft sell anything. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said and I'm going to invite you to be his follower, but I want you to know going in. But this really is a message to the followers of Jesus because he is brutally direct about what he wants from us. So if... Um, if you identify as a follower of Christ, hear this, please. Because it begins with confession, which leads to another question, which is, have you confessed Jesus? Look back at verse 20. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. In Matthew 16, it's recorded as him saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter is the first person to declare that Jesus is God incarnate, that he's God in the flesh, that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father, and, and he declares that, and Jesus says, that's right. Don't tell anyone yet. That's right. So Peter was the very first one to acknowledge Jesus as the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. But Paul follows that up in Romans 10, and he says, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So have you confessed Jesus as Lord? Have you confessed Jesus as your master, as your king, as the ruler of your life? So have you? Now, if you've confessed Jesus as Lord, have you taken that first step of obedience? Have you publicly acknowledged Jesus in baptism? See, some of you are like, I got baptized at the lake a couple weeks ago. I'm really glad I did now. See, the, uh, on the day of Pentecost, which if you don't, if you don't know the story of Pentecost, it's, it's okay. It's found in Acts chapter 2. You can pick, look it up and read it uh, with one of the Bibles you take home. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, the church was born on, on the day of Pentecost. That's, the disciples were praying. Jesus had already gone to heaven. They were waiting, and the Holy Spirit came and indwelled every single person who was a follower of Jesus and 3,000 people came to faith that day. And you know what it says they did? After Peter preached, 3,000 people believed and were what? Baptized. 3,000 people. They didn't wait. They didn't take a class. They said, I'm all in. I'm following Jesus. What do I have to do? I'm, how do I tell the world that I'm following Jesus? They got baptized. See, all in means all in the water. That's where it starts. By the way, in case you're wondering why we emphasize bapti baptism and why we baptize, uh, number one, Jesus commanded it. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We baptize because it's the biblical declaration of faith. 
They never ask anyone in Scripture to raise their hands, pray a prayer, walk an aisle, uh, do any of that kind of stuff, fill out a Connect card. If you wanted to declare Jesus as your Savior, you got wet. That's how you did it. And, and by the way, in Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul explains, baptism is a picture of us being united with Christ. Just as Jesus died and was buried and rose from the dead, that's what baptism is a picture. It's us saying, I'm dead to my old self, and I'm being buried with Christ, and now I'm raised to a whole new way of living. So I just have to ask, have you confessed Jesus? Now, if you haven't, what are you waiting for? I mean, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, and you believe he died on the cross to pay for your sins, it was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, then seriously, what are you waiting for? I mean, maybe you're saying, I don't have an opportunity. Guess what? We will baptize you tonight. I mean, we just do it. I mean, we usually have water in that tub. We have water in that tub. So I'm, I'm just being serious. I'm not going to belabor this. But if you're here and the Holy Spirit right now is going, you should get baptized. Uh, there's a deacon or two out in the, the lobby right out here. If you'll just go back there and tell them, we'll baptize you at the end of the service tonight. We don't care if you go home wet. It's 108 degrees outside. You will not die. <laughs> Your car seats will dry by the time you get, you know, wake up in the morning. It's okay. So uh, just take us up on that because we can do this uh, today. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus and you have been baptized, then uh, I, I want you to see what Jesus says next. Because Jesus confronts our desire for comfort, convenience, and indulgence by demanding surrender, sacrifice, and self-denial. Jesus confronts our desires for comfort, convenience, and indulgence by demanding surrender, sacrifice, and self-denial. Look at verses 23 and 24 again. He said, to all, that's us, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. See, immediately after describing his own imminent death, Jesus bluntly explains the cost of following him. Okay? He says, all in for Jesus requires self-denial. Self-denial. Now, I just confess, I like comfort. I like pleasure. I like indulgence. I mean, basically, I'm a selfish person. Just like you. Right? I, I mean... You know, uh, we all are. That's kind of the root of sin is I want to take care of myself at your expense. Uh, and, and left to our own desires, we will build a self-centered world around our preferences, our interests, and our comfort. And, and by the way, that's true for everybody in this world, but it happens in churches just the same, which is why so many churches are dying because they're geared around the comfort of their people rather than the mission of Christ. Now, Jesus rudely and wonderfully calls us to reject that life. Let me say that again. Jesus rudely and wonderfully denounces our selfish life desires. He tells us to deny ourselves, to fight the selfish urges. After all, love isn't selfish. If we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, if we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, we cannot be selfish people. Love doesn't demand its own way. What does love do? Love serves. Love sacrifices for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the mission. After all, Jesus sacrificed his own life for us, and he asked us as his followers to sacrifice our time, energy, and resources to his mission. That's going all in. Jesus requires his followers to sacrifice their dreams, their values, their goals for his purpose. Let me say that again. This is the part a lot of times we miss in church because we want to do our thing and kind of still bless Jesus a little bit. Jesus just goes, no, I want all of you, which means I want your dreams, I want your goals, I want your values. I want to reshape them in my image because my plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. That's what he's saying. See, he wants us to give up our dreams, our values, our goals for his purpose. That's all in. And the only way we can get to this place of sacrifice and self-denial is through surrender. Surrender. It's at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I give up. 
God, I give up control of my life. I give up control of my plans. I give up control of my values. I give up myself, even to the point of my own life, for Jesus. How do we do that? I mean, honestly, we look at that. How do we do that as the people of God? How would we look at this and go, realistically, I'm willing to surrender everything to Jesus? It's by believing Jesus when he says, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Whoever saves his life is going to lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Following Jesus means full-blown surrender. Trusting God that his plans are better than your plans. That his thoughts are wiser than your thoughts. That his love is greater than anything you can imagine or comprehend. So we decide we're going to follow at all costs. And we can do this because we know that God always redeems our lives and heaven is our destiny. Okay, if you believe that heaven is your destiny, you should have no fear at following whatever God asks you to do. And if you believe that God always redeems whatever is going on in your life, you can trust him with whatever is going on in your life. Let me give you an example of being all in for Jesus in just one instance. Uh, I got a friend, his name's David Johnson. Uh, he's the executive director uh, of the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention. He's been a pastor, he's been a teacher, pr a professor, all this kind of stuff, but he's a great guy. His son, Jeremiah, was, uh, I would say, typical pastor's kid. He was rebellious, and David was like, I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen with him. He's not seeming to wanna follow God at all. Well, he ended up going at 18 on a mission trip to Africa, and God changed his life, and he said, Dad, I'm gonna volunteer. I'm gonna go back and live in Africa for two years and serve. And, and he was there, and he was working with people. There was no church in this, in this village, in this area. And he was playing soccer with kids, and he led some of the kids to Christ. And then he was tragically killed in a motorcycle accident. So David went there to see the people that his son was investing in. And while he was there, he got to baptize like eight people from that village. First baptisms. And then he started going back and teaching pastors uh, and, and raising money so that he could, you know, get, give these pastors motorcycles so they could travel all over the place and do more ministry. And, and on one of those trips in 2016, I went with him. I said, I'll go and teach pastors. Sure, let's go. Let's do this. I never met Jeremiah. I don't know Jeremiah. But I know David. And so I went with David. And I said to, I said to her, the missionary there, John, I said, hey, how, how can we bless you? And he said, why don't you give money for a well? It's about $3,000. That blesses, you know, about 750 to 1,000 people with fresh water. And, uh, and, it, and it helps us to bless the people and it helps us to start churches. And I said, okay, well, we'll Calvary will do it well. And I shared that with you guys. And, and before I left, we had already sponsored like five more wells. Well, guess what? Six years later, Calvary has sponsored over 70 wells in Mozambique. Yeah, you guys have done that. Which means, I just want to put this in a little bit of math uh, for you. It means that about 55,000 people every single day drink clean water because of your generosity. I mean, that's basically the population of Lake Havasu. And, and uh, so next up is Mojave County. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> And, and they've started about a dozen churches in places where they weren't welcome to start churches. Why? Because they put wells in. And, and so there is a sea of life change and lives impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ because one young man went all in for Jesus. That's how God redeems. That's how God designs things that, that are way beyond our comprehension. That's how God uses our surrender, our sacrifice, and our self-denial. And this is where the enemy and our selfishness begins to argue with the plans of God. Just begins to tell us, no, 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 you can't do that. Because we say things to ourselves like, but I don't want to sacrifice. We're struggling as it is. I need to pamper myself. I have needs too. I'll just take care of me for a little while. I'll sacrifice later. Or maybe Satan whispers in your ear, you're not going to let that preacher or Jesus tell you what to do or change how you think or act, are you? I mean, we know better. We know what's best for us. Or maybe he whispers, your dreams for yourself are better than God's plans after all. I mean, you don't want God asking you to die in Africa. Or worse, your kids or your grandkids, do you? 
See, we all face the battle. We all have the voices lying to us. And we all want to justify putting ourselves first. But please hear Jesus again. Jesus warned that the self-centered life ends empty. You heard him say it. Look at it again. Verse 24. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So you save your life. You live it selfishly and it's gone. You gain the world. You accomplish your dreams. You achieve success that you wanted and you lose your soul. And quite possibly your family, your marriage, your kids, your self-respect in the process. You see, Jesus is the way. Most of us believe that. Jesus is the truth. Most of us believe that. Jesus is the life. We say we believe it, but are we living it? Are you all in for Jesus? You see, all I know is that you can trust Jesus. He forgives, he heals, he restores, he changes life. Jesus will change every single part of your life if you'll go all in. And by the way, it doesn't matter how quickly you get all in. Some of you leaped into a relationship with Jesus without sticking your toe in the water. Some of you put your toe in the water and, and then jumped. And some of you, you've been inching in that direction for a long time. It really doesn't matter how you get in as long as you are in Christ and all in him. So are you all in? Because it's the only way to life. Now, Here's the thing. I don't want you just to hear this sermon and go, oh, that was really good. Oh, yeah, I really agree with that. Yeah, that was really good. And then walk out and keep living your life exactly the same way. Because if you do that, then you'll be like me a few weeks ago on my sabbatical. See, I, I spent a week in prayer up at uh, a little cabin up in the Wallapies. Beautiful little A-frame. Uh, and uh, the one thing about it is I had these steps going up to the loft right in the, the middle of the house. Beautiful wooden steps. And, uh, and I was staying up, up in the loft area and uh, just praying and just seeking God. But the, the steps were really slick. And I, I said to myself, oh, you know what? You shouldn't walk down those steps in sock feet. Because that would be dangerous. That would be foolish. And I, so I didn't, you know. And it was the last day that I was there and I was out on the porch and, and I was reading and praying and, and my feet got cold. I was barefoot and in shorts. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go up and put some socks on my feet, put some sweatpants on. And so I did that. And I got upstairs and I, and I put the socks on, I put the sweatpants on and I looked at my shoes. Honestly, I looked at my shoes. I said, I should probably put those on. Do you think I put those shoes on? Yeah. No. No, I didn't. I started walking down the steps. There are 13 steps. I made it to about step four or five. Yeah, some of you know. <laughs> and then I slipped. And I, I'm wearing, you know, a cotton shirt. I'm wearing cotton sweatpants. I'm wearing cotton socks. I, you might as well have greased me up and put me down a slide. <laughs> because I went down that thing on my left side, on my back, on my arm, and I hit the bottom. And once I knew that I wasn't dead or broken... I just said, Chad, you guys know what I said? Chad, you idiot. I did. That was my prayer at that point. It was confession because I was an idiot. I knew the right thing to do. I even thought about the right thing to do. But did I do it? No. And because I didn't do the right thing. What did I do? I crashed. Now, thankfully, I wasn't broken. I could have been broken. Could have hit my head. Could have died there at the bottom of those steps. I realized that. I realized that. That's why I yelled out, Chad, you idiot. All I was was bruised and hurting and bloody. But otherwise, I got away with it. So here's the thing. What I realized laying there in pain was that's exactly how we live our lives. 
followers of Jesus. We read the Bible. We know what the Bible says. We listen to sermons. You're sitting here listening to sermons. You're turning in online listening to a sermon. And we know what we're supposed to do, but do we do it? No, we, we look at it. We even acknowledge, I shouldn't do this. And then we go and we do it. And then we wonder why our lives crash. We wonder why we slip down the stairs and we're broken and battered and bruised again. And yes, we're repentant, but I'm telling you right now, I will never walk down a set of wooden steps and socked feet in my life. I am committed to that. But how many times do we make the same mistakes over and over and over again? Aren't you tired of that? We talk about our world and about making a difference in this world and the way that we're going to make a difference if we go all in and we start living for Jesus like never before. So let's go all in. And I don't even know what that means for you. Maybe you're sitting here and or tuning in and you've never confessed Jesus. Then going all in means confessing Jesus. Some of you believe in Jesus, you've never been baptized. It means you go all in, you get baptized. For some of you, it means you pick up that serve card and you say, okay, I'm gonna get off the bench and I'm gonna get in the game and you fill it out and you take a risk. Maybe it's just that you need to repent. If so, then listen to the Holy Spirit and do what he says. Maybe it means that Monday night, you need to show up right here in this room at 6.30 and go to Celebrate Recovery. You go, but I don't know what good that'll do. Well, it'll do you good. But you gotta try, you gotta show up. Maybe it means that you go get counseling. Maybe it means you recommit to your marriage. Maybe it means you put your phone down and play with your kids. But whatever Jesus asks you to do, the wise thing to do is to obey him. Completely, 100%. Because what does it profit you if you get exactly what you want and lose your soul. Let's pray. Father, we are hopeless without you. We are desperate without you. We need you to change us. We need you to forgive us. We need you to heal us. We need you to fix our marriages. We need you to help us to love our kids. We need you to, to help us be kind and compassionate towards people. God, we need you to help us forgive others. We need you to help us live for Jesus in a way that makes people want to know our Savior. So change us. We surrender right now. I give up. And I pray that every person in this room and every person joining us online will give up as well. We'll stop fighting you. We'll embrace you. We'll embrace your wisdom. And we will live our lives for the King of kings and Lord, our Lord, Lord of lords who gave himself for us. There's nothing more that you ask and nothing less that you'll accept. So we are yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.